earn a 2.5% commission, that's hundreds or even thousands of dollars, when you take two minutes to make an introduction to Pipeline through our Ambassador Program. All of the free content Pipeline brings to the engineering community, the Being an Engineer podcast, the Wave, our free online platform for engineers, and our CAD Club volunteer organization for aspiring young engineers, is possible because Pipeline exists. By making just one introduction, you can support Pipeline's core business and in so doing, support the aforementioned initiatives we provide that enrich the entire engineering community. Start making an impact today at teampipeline.us forward slash ambassador. That's teampipeline.us forward slash ambassador. Try to figure out how to design some of these molds for these parts that come in is solving puzzles. Um, you have to, I have to be really creative to try to figure out how to do that. And, and that is so fun for me. Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we are speaking with Dylan Seriani, a distinguished figure in the field of mechanical engineering and the co-founder and principal mechanical engineer at Protoshop. With a rich background in biomechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, Dylan has carved a niche in the medical device industry, showcasing her expertise in product development, particularly in in vitro diagnostics and orthopedics. Her career spans over 25 years, marked by a deep commitment to innovation, quality, and efficiency in engineering design. At Protoshop, Dylan leads the charge in revolutionizing prototype tooling, emphasizing the replication of production mold quality in prototypes. Today, she joins us to share her insights, experiences, and the exciting advancements at Protoshop. Dylan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Okay. So tell me, what made you decide to become an engineer? Well, I've always kind of liked to tear things apart and see how they worked. And my mom recognized this in me early. And, you know, I I was a good student and did well in school and liked science, loved math and was looking for a career path. And my mom said, you know what, I've done some research and you should be an electrical engineer. And I said, okay. So that's about as much thought as I put into it. Um, I just figured I'd get to make things and see how things work. And that was good enough for me. Yeah. So did you start in electrical then? I did. I did. And my junior year, I took an anatomy course and I realized that I really liked the human body. And if my, if the Dean of Electrical Engineering hadn't said, most women don't make it through this program. When I met him as a freshman, <laughs> I probably would have uh, would have switched to, you know, mechanical engineering and or you know pre med. Yeah, but challenge accepted, huh? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Take that, <laughs> Dean. All right. Well, you do. I think quite a lot of mechanical design now. Is that accurate? I do. I, I I found that I didn't really like the electrical engineering, but I was I was an athlete and got hurt a lot and was really interested in the mechanism of injury. And then when I went to grad school at University of California at Berkeley, I wanted to kind of focus on the engineering of the body. So I got into biomechanics. Yeah. Okay. So take us, I mean, you know, briefly a minute or two between graduating with your degree in biomechanics and now where you are a co-founder of Protoshop. Sure. So I, I, my first job was at an orthopedic bracing company and I was working on knee braces, post-op braces, elbow braces, all kinds of things for the mechanical, um, the mechanical side of orthopedic bracing. So we were developing plastic parts and bending metal and, um, doing field study with athletes it was really fun. Um, I did that for a number of years, then took a break and worked at Children's Hospital in the motion analysis lab, doing gait analysis of kids that have cerebral palsy. Then some airplanes hit the, the World Trade Center and I lost my job. So I went back to the orthopedic industry for about 10 years. And then after that, moved to a product development company that did mostly in vitro diagnostic disposables. And part of that 
business had a lot of back end manufacturing. So it had um, mold makers, molding machines, plastic joining technology to support the in vitro diagnostic disposable market. Um, because you have to actually test the assays on the cartridges just to make sure that they work. And then there are a lot of changes. So the really quick iterations made a lot of sense that the manufacturing was done in-house or the prototyping was done in-house. And, you know, I was a director of engineering there. um, And the guy who ran the shop, the master machinist there, we saw a lot of business being turned away from companies that needed a little bit more engineering prototype molding. And so we thought we could make a go of it, um, you know, supporting companies that didn't have that kind of prototype molding. Terrific. So tell us a little bit what about the difference between production molding and prototype molding. Production molds are usually made of a, um, you know, a high strength stainless steel tool steel. And it takes a lot of time to cut the cavities. There are usually multiple cavities so that every time you open and close the mold, you get a bunch of parts. Um, prototype molding is more used for um, figuring out if your design is going to work, if it's going to be scalable into those high production tools. Um, it gives you an opportunity to test them in clinical trials. And in the case of in vitro diagnostic disposables, then you get to do your assays on them. Um, but they are primarily single cavity um, and they are machined out of a softer aluminum material so you can make them faster. And then all of the side pulls, any mechanisms that you have that you'd normally have in a production tool that makes it highly automated are done manually. Mm, so we run okay. vertical molding presses and we hand lay up any of the core pins or they're also called pickouts. The part, um, you know, when the mold opens, the part is ejected and it already it has these metal core pins in them that we have to then manually strip. So it makes it so that you can get to a part a lot faster and you can do all your testing. Um, But the parts are more expensive because you only have a single cavity and you have a lot, the cycle times longer because of the manual nature of, you know, removing the core pins. Right. So so there's a trade-off there. You get parts faster, but the the parts cost a little bit more. Um, You're not going to be doing high volume production with this. Can you, uh, without necessarily disclosing specific prices, but can you give us kind of a, a rough ballpark of, you know, if you're going to pay a uh, hundred grand for a production mold that's maybe multi-cavities, it's fully automated with all the, the side actions and things like that versus something that you would do that is a little bit more manual. It's going to be single cavity. What what are the costs like and, and what kind of volumes are, are typical for some of your condus- customers with the, the prototype tooling? Sure. You know, it all depends on the level of detail, the number of side actions that you have, you know, the slides that you have to create the geometry that's off of the parting line that's not in that same direction. But, you know, for a, for a typical part, you know, we start with about a $4,000 cost just to make the inserts and to um, to mold the part to design the mold. So that's about $4,000. And then it's just how much does it cost to cut the detail of your part after that? So our our molds, I think the the lowest one we've had has been about forty five hundred, and then the most expensive one we have has been twenty five thousand for something that has, you know, crazy uh, small detail cutting to do. So we yeah. we can you know we're a little bit specialized in that we're used to cutting with really small tools, and can cut you know radiuses down to two and a half thousandths sometimes wow. so other prototype shops don't like to do that kind of stuff because it takes a lot of time um, but we can do that you know as long as we have a tool that's long enough to do it then we can do some of the more intricate stuff so that's the ones that are get to be a little bit more expensive yeah how have you found this process to benefit product development teams who maybe want or need to to test their engineering uh, their designs, but, you know, they don't want to pay a hundred grand and get into production before they're really ready and have proven out the design. Yeah. It, it sometimes it makes sense to just go straight to production. So I had a company call me, they wanted to do like an air hockey, hockey puck risk is low, you know, make it round is probably going to work. Um, but for in vitro diagnostics where you're putting um, human samples into a cartridge and then you have to mix with buffers and reagents and you have to test your valve and all kinds of stuff. It doesn't make sense to go straight to production and making, 
you know, a 32 cavity mold when it's not going to work. And if you find you have to change something, you have to change it 32 times in a hardened tool steel, which involves, you know, a lot of times welding and then recutting. So it just kind of depends on the application. Um, I, I, in vitro diagnostics makes a lot of sense. A lot of kind of uh, handheld medical devices that have triggers and buttons that actuate, you want to make sure that you're picking the right materials and that they're, the feel is right, things like that. So anything that has kind of a user interaction or some sort of um, thing that can't be tested with 3D prototypes, um, it makes yeah. sense. What are some of the most common materials that that you use? And are they truly the exact same materials as you would find in the production parts? Yeah, typically, you know, housings are made of ABS. Um, we use a lot of polycarbonates. If you have some optical clarity requirements, you might use a COC or a COP. Those are cyclic olefin copolymer, cyclic olefin polymer. Um, so we use a, we we do a lot of those. We've we do nylons, we do Delrin, we do you know pretty much anything that the customer wants to use. They can even send us and have us try. We have a customer that's sending us Ultum and polysulfone which is a high temperature material. That's something else that our shop does that other people don't do. They take specialized presses that can go to the higher temperatures required to process that material. But yeah, so we some we say, you know, I've I've spent a lot of times in medical time in medical devices. So I know the polycarbs and I know the polypropylenes, that's another one that are tip and the polystyrenes that are used in medical devices. So it's the ones that I used when I was developing those products, you know, for 10 years. So I know that they work, so I can recommend those. But if they have a specific material they want to use, they can send it to me and we'll use it. Terrific. What are some of the largest cost drivers for the prototype molds that you're producing? Is it Does it just come down to level of detail or are there other considerations that for those who are listening to this right now, maybe they think, wow, we could really use something like this, but I want to make sure and, and minimize our costs. What are some pro tips that engineers can use to minimize the cost of even prototype tooling? Think about how the part is going to be getting out of the mold. So the parting lines, how you're going to pull it apart. Um, if you can eliminate side actions by having snaps created by through holes from the other side, that that eliminates us having to manually pick out core pins from the mold. Um, also, uh, radiuses. If you give a, if you specify a five thousandths radius, that means I have to use a ten thousandths cutter um, most of the time. If it's a small feature, then I have to use small cutters. Uh, I recently helped a customer who the mold was fifteen thousand dollars, and just by a few tweaks, we got it down to ten. Wow! So it really is just about the time it takes to cut it. Yeah, for the yeah. cost of the mold. And is there a typical timeline, time between um, you receiving the order and first parts coming out of the press? It, I'm sure, of course, it depends uh, to a large degree on on what the geometry is, how how intricate it is. But uh, a lot of the time for, for production tooling, you're, you're talking about, you know, maybe eight or 10 weeks before you even get your first parts. What What are some typical timelines for prototype tooling? Last week, we made a, a mold for a customer in three days. Wow. And again, you're right. You're absolutely right. It depends on the level of detail. So if I have a lot of really small features, that's going to take, you know, 120 hours of machine time to cut. And then, you know, in between that 120 hours, there's a machinist programming those. It can, it can get up to two weeks, you know, for something really, um, you know, really detailed and with that I have to use small cutters for. Yeah. Um, and then it depends on what's in our shop. But, you know, we, we we just keep buying machines. And, you know, when we run out of capacity, we buy more machines and, you know, we add people. So, you know, we're trying to get it so that it's under two weeks for everybody. But sometimes it'll get into three um, mm -hmm. if we have a lot of stuff in the shop. The mold that you did in three days last week, that was for a hockey puck? <laughs> it was something close to that. <laughs> it was like a little rectangle with uh, some cutouts and it had some bumps on it. So, yeah, it was it was pretty quick. Nice, nice. 
Okay, well, uh, taking a step away from specifically Photoshop and just uh, a little bit more general conversation here, what are some of the most significant advancements that you, you've seen in medical device product development over the years, it, whether it's a new technology or uh, new materials or, or new new processes, new, new techniques for doing something? Anything in particular come to mind? That's a really good question. You know, I did a lot of work in microfluidics at my previous company, and there were some really cool technologies there that we tried to integrate into our our cartridges. There were um, there was one company that did this mixing. You know, because when you're doing it on a cartridge and you add two things, you, you can't just you know sometimes you agitate it or sometimes you put it through channels and you have it mix up stuff and but. But a lot of times the fluids just don't kind of mix together. There was one company that came up with a way to electrify little filiform little fingers that would kind of move and and mix things. So that was really cool. Um, But the reality was, is that they're very costly. And for a disposable, um, brute force is cheaper than the really cool technology. So I, I did learn that, you know, even if <laughs> even if you have a really cool technology, making it marketable and making it um, commercializable is is a little tougher. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about 3D printing? Has that altered the way that prototype tooling is made at all? I know that there are some 3D printing resins that at least they're advertised as being usable for uh limited uh, injection molding tooling. Is that anything that Protoshop ever uses? You know, we're always looking at that. Just to, we don't want to be the Kodak and uh, go out of business because we're not paying attention to the trends of the future. So um, I'm always looking at that, trying to decide if if it's gotten better and gotten good enough. Um, the truth is for microfluidics, a lot of things have to be within a few thousandths tolerance. And a lot of the stuff that we develop is um, really tight tolerance requirement. So um, no, we haven't gotten it. Um, and then the, the materials that you mold with are higher usually in temperature requirements than the 3D printed, you know, mm. inserts or base. Yeah. So it, you know, there is, we have, I have used DMLS parts. That's a, a metal um, sintering printed part for some of the core pins that are a little bit more difficult to machine to save my customers money. Um, but that finish that comes off of those is very rough. Um, so I, I take them from the 3D printer and I will, well, I'll have our guys sand them themselves. But once you start sanding, you've lost you know, tenths and thousands and things like that and getting them yeah. to shut off properly in the mold so that the plastic doesn't flash in any gaps is a little bit difficult. Um, but recently, last week, I ordered a, a, a kind of an Acme threaded uh, core pin that we're going to use because the tolerance of that is not as tight as, you know, a, a machine part needs to be. And that part was a hundred bucks instead of us machining, it would have been a couple thousand. So where I can, I try to save my customers money. Um, there also is a technology that we keep exploring, which is a combination 3D printing and CNC machining, which allows you to kind of, um, you know, machine undercut sort of. So that lays down the layer that centers the layer of metal down and then allows you to machine that layer. And then it lays down the next layer and then allows you to machine um, but the registration, yeah, it's pretty cool. They're five hundred thousand oh, wow. dollar machines, so Whew. it'll be a while before I can afford one of those. Um, and then, you know, the problem is, is that it's still the tolerance isn't quite what you need sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, tolerances are very demanding when it comes to injection molded parts. Yeah, I had a customer that wanted tents, um, and that's just not, you know, in a high high shrink material. So if you if you don't know that when you when you injection mold a part, you um, you have to account for the shrink of the plastic because after you mold it, the plastics, the, the molecules are going to all align and they're going to shrink. And it shrinks differently depending on what your geometry is. So it's a little bit unpredictable. So to get to something that's, you know, less than a thou tolerance or less, you know, less than a half a thou tolerance is pretty tough. I have a question for you about draft. Uh, for for those of you, probably most people are familiar with what draft is. If not, draft is just a very small angle that is applied to plastic parts 
the, that allows them to be ejected from the mold much more easily than if they were just you know perfectly straight or, or vertical walls. Um, typically, what I've seen is is one to three degrees, but I've heard. I've heard disagreement between different molders, you know, as far as what, how much draft they want. Of course, probably more is is better for the molder because the more draft there is, the easier it is to get out of the part. I have typically used one degree as kind of my my default draft angle, but I know other engineers who are are adamant that it should be three degrees. Do you have, what's, what's your standard draft angle? Well, we're prototype molders, so we do um, other tricks, and we don't care as much about throughput. Mm. So um, sometimes I don't even have any draft. Oh, interesting. Depending on I'm um, okay. and, and in the medical device industry, uh, if we do a syringe, they don't want any draft on the mm. barrel because they're yeah. going to have an elastomer come down. They want to be able to tightly control that. Um, but in general, it I'd say again, it depends. It depends on uh, the material that you're going to be molding in. Um, and it depends on the brittleness of that material. And it depends on which side of the mold is going to release first. So we'll call that the cavity side is, you know, you want the mold to open up and you want to predictably know which side the part is going to stick on. So on the part that that where the mold pulls away, the cavity side, you want more draft than on the other side because you want it to stay in that side. So that you don't trash your mold, because if part of the part part of the part sticks in the wrong side, it can bend things and break things and all kinds of stuff. So, um, some of your more rigid materials, I'd say three degrees is good um, for polypropylenes, which are really forgiving. You know, one degree. I've gotten you know half a degree um, is okay, and uh, I I I kind of prefer sometimes to not draft the side that I want it to stick on. Okay, great. Good information. Well, let me take a a very short break and share that our company, Pipeline Design and Engineering, develops new and innovative manufacturing processes for complex products, then implements them into manual fixtures or fully automated machines to dramatically reduce production costs and improve production yields for OEMs. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Dylan Seriani. So, Dylan, um, what what advice would you give younger engineers who are aspiring to move into the the world of medical device design? Well, it's it's interesting because I gave a talk at my undergraduate college uh, on medical devices, and it's not something that they even taught. So, it wasn't even an industry that they were really even aware of in the mechanical engineering department. And it's such a vast, a vast, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a business, you know, medical devices. There's big DME, Durkle medical equipment um, design. There's in vitro diagnostics. There's orthopedic bracing, which was super fun for me. Um, All kinds of medical devices that are out there. And it's a very, very... uh, Not lucrative business, but stable business. Um, So when other people are having layoffs, the medical devices aren't quite so much um, because people are always going to be getting sick and they're always going to be needing medicines. They're also they're always going to be needing these these devices to stay healthy. So um, it's I, I guess my advice is, you know, it's a great business and it's not something that you if you if you have good solid engineering principles you can apply them to this business it's not like you have to learn something specific for it but the more you understand about um biology and the human body and kind of the neural pathways and the chemistry of the body um it helps you to kind of understand the things that you're developing how about any uh, specific technologies are are there areas of study that you would encourage, especially younger engineers, maybe students right now going to university, any particular areas of of research or technologies that you think are um, emerging trends that are going to be really big and important two, three, five years from now that that they should start learning now? I see a lot of movement in the kind of the genetic sequencing Mm. going on. Um, I think that medicine is going to become very personal. They're going to develop develop vaccines specifically for people and for people's certain DNA. So I think that the more that you understand sort of that side of it, um, the better off you'll be. 
And I think I think it's it's fascinating. I had um, one of my daughter's friends passed from cancer, and they they took specifically her cancer, and were developing a vaccine that targeted specifically the genes that she um, that were mutated, or you know that they were trying to fix, so that they could go in and just target those things. Um, I think there's a lot of work being done on uh, what's called uh, medical probes. So ways to inject a probe that would go and find certain cancer cells so that they could then target things that are there. So I just think it's medicine's getting a lot more specific. And the more that you can, you know, take some biology, take some anatomy, take some kinesiology classes if you're really interested in it. Take some of the neuroscience classes so you understand kind of how the body works and you'll be much better off when you're talking to these scientists um, that are um, coming up with assays or or, or immunobiological bio, um, mechanisms um, to be able to understand what's going on. Let's go back to material selection just for a minute here. And can you provide any rules of thumb for engineers who are uh, wanting to I guess initially prototype injection mold apart, but, you know, looking off to production as well. Uh, you mentioned a few common materials, ABS, PC, nylon, uh, polyethylene, things like that. Uh, are there some general rules of thumb that you can share about you should consider this type of material if your product is ABC, but you should consider that type of material if your project product is, is XYZ, anything like that, that that you can share? I know it, it, the, the answer is always, it depends, but yeah. are there some general rules of thumb that we can <laughs> at least start with foundationally? Sure. Uh, I recently uh, tried to write a blog for my website, um, um, Understanding Material Data Sheets. And it's supposed to have, be a guide that kind of helps you walk through, you know, what does my product need to do? What kind of loads is it going to be seeing? What kind of chemicals is it going to be um, seeing? Um, and that helps you kind of down select into the material that you need. Um, in general, if you're looking for a, a material, something that's going to be holding um, solids or you don't want you know, anything anything from the plastic to leach into your fluids, um, you're going to be looking at a polypropylene type thing. If you're worried about if you have like a, a buffer that you're going to store on a shelf for a couple of years, you know, you need to worry about the moisture vapor transmission. You know, is it going to be evaporating and then it will change the concentration of the assay that I'm going to run because I, you know, my volumes are different. So polypropylenes are really good for that. Um, polycarbonates are, are a workhorse. They're a little more expensive than a polystyrene, but they're more durable. So if you are, you know, worried that if you drop it, it's going to splatter, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff over if the part breaks, then you'd probably move to a polycarbonate over a polystyrene because polystyrene breaks really easily. Um, and then you have to consider light transmission. So if you need it to be clear because you're going to be looking at molecules in, um, you know, PCR chambers, then you'd use, like I said, the COCs. Great. All right. That's a, that's a perfect um, basic starting point there. How about the the regulatory environment? You're you're dealing with medical uh, devices, healthcare spaces, and of course, in that industry, uh, regulator regulatory and, and FDA concerns are are always a thing that have to be considered. Is it uh, does it have much of an effect on what you are doing since your work is largely in the prototype phase, and and maybe those regulations are not so stringent at that point. It does and it doesn't. It depends on what my customers need. So some customers that are um, they're required to use ISO 13485 facilities or ISO 9001 facilities, they may not be able to use us. However, I did come from a, an ISO 13485 um, for medical device development company. And uh, we have we are using the same processes for, you know, material tracing, lot traceability, um, you know, rev control changes, things like that. We're using all those processes and we're in the process of writing them down now so that we can get that ISO 9001 certification. Um, but as far as a prototype molder, most people don't need it. Um, it's early on in the development. Um, they're just trying to figure out, you know, which path they're going to go or if the snaps work or if their assay works or something like that. And then once they they want, once they get that all worked out, they're going to go to a production builder that has all of those 
um, that has all those certifications in place. Um, yeah. As far as engineering goes, um, you know, when you are doing a medical device and you are required to be under design control, um, it's a lot of what you do. It's a lot of what you do. You have to um, do design and development plans. You have to have a design input. You have to have a design output that matches. So you show, okay, this is what I said it was going to do. And here's the proof that this is what I said it was going to do. And there's a lot of testing and proof and uh, that has to go along with that before you can even transfer it to manufacturing. And then you have to do all kinds of process validations and field trials and show that you're your product does exactly what you said it was going to do. And that whole packet, you know, gets submitted to, you know, the FDA or whatever for certification, um, just so that you can have that ISO certification on your, on your medical device. So, um, you know, if you are developing a medical device, depending on what class it is, a class one is um, kind of a, a less regulatory heavy one versus a class two, which means that, that you know, it does um, contact the skin and it goes, you know, maybe through the skin transdermal. Class three is an implantable, for example. You know, the level of documentation just is crazy um, once you get up to that. So yeah. I didn't like any of that, which is why, you know, I kind of went to a product <laughs> development company where we got to just come and come up with the ideas, make some prototypes, and then say, okay, now you guys get to go do the fun stuff. So. Yeah, off to the next one. Yeah I, yeah, I had similar experiences. I worked for a different company before I started Pipeline, and we did a lot of product development for medical devices. And I was there when they started spooling up their um, uh, ISO 1345 certification. And so I got to be a part of going through all this training and, and now there's all this paperwork that has to be generated. And it was understandably, it, it's, it's a necessary evil, right? But just like you, I did not particularly enjoy that, <laughs> that aspect of it. So. So I got fired. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I was in um in my bracing capacity. I was always the maverick that was trying to get around the system and do stuff because it just seems so dumb to me to try to like I want to change the way this part looks. It's not going to affect the function. I could just yeah. tell, you know. And um, I, so I was always trying to figure out ways to get around it. And then at my newest company, um, I was the only one that had worked in um. Uh, worked in a company where products had actually gone to market. Everybody else was kind of R and D, so they gave me the quality system to control oh, no. and to train everybody. <laughs> so I, I felt like that was karma for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how funny. Well, um, tell me a little bit about what what motivates you. You know, what what gets gets you up in the morning and uh, motivates you to go into work and do what you do. Well, I, you know, it's. When when we started Protoshop, it sort of it sort of just kind of dropped in my lap. I've always kind of wanted to start ha have my own business. I've never liked people telling me what to do, um, and uh, but I was too scared. I was risk averse, and I I didn't know if I could do it on my own. But when the machinist came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I think we have this opportunity," um, and he had some funding, and I. I knew that he knew everything that I didn't know and that I knew the stuff that he didn't know. So I felt like that would, it was almost like a, a perfect world. You know, I had, and we had a, an advisor that had done this before as well. So all I had to do was have the courage to quit my job. And it was a very good job. I love my job. I loved working at the place that I was working at. Um, but I had just, you know, my mom had just passed. And so, you know, I was able to take the money from the sale of her home to pay off my house so, and most of my kids are out of the house. And so I was like, if I'm ever going to do it, like, this is when I'm going to do it, right? If I fail, then I'm not going to be out on the street. Um, or at least my kids aren't going to be out on the street. And, <laughs> you know, I could get a job working at McDonald's or something and support, you know, us. So um, really now, um, I don't ever have a problem getting out of bed because I'm working for myself and everything that I do directly benefits me or my employees. Um, and I feel like I'm creating something, I'm providing worth. And honestly, I was a little bit nervous that, you know, not doing the engineering, I'd be a little bored because um, I've never really, I, I keep getting pushed into management, maybe because I'm not a very good engineer. But, um, you know, my, I love doing the hands-on stuff and I was afraid that I would miss that. But, you know, kind of try to figure out how to design some of these molds for these parts that come in 
is solving puzzles. Um, you have to, I have to be really creative to try to figure out how to do that. And, and that is so fun for me. I didn't know how fun that was going to be for me. Um, I'll sit on my couch all day Saturday and do it just because I, I, it's, it's just really fun. So I get the creative part of it. I get the, you know, I'm creating jobs, which feels really good. Um, and then I know that my efforts directly benefit um, other people as well as maybe someday me, you know, I'm, I'm making, you know, if, if I put in the number of hours that I'm working and divide up my, my salary, I'm probably getting paid less than, you know, what I was when I first got out of college. But um, it's just fun having something that's my own. It's it's interesting how that works, isn't it? I remember when I was working for this other engineering company, I put in my 40 hours and I was out. You know, I was mm-hmm. I was done. I did not want to spend any more time than I had to um, towards the end. In the beginning, it was it was. I was a lot more engaged, but towards the end, it, the company was a little slow, which was part of the problem. And so the work that was available to be done was largely paperwork. And it just, it wasn't, it wasn't fun for me, mm-hmm. um, which, you, you know, all the responsibility is on me, right? I, I made the choice to become kind of disengaged and then I got, uh, then I got axed. Anyway, my point in saying this w- w- is that when I started Pipeline after getting laid off at this, this other place, even though I did not enjoy what I was doing towards the end at this other place and I was putting in the, the bare minimum number of hours, 40 hours a week, then I started Pipeline and I was probably doing 60, sometimes 70 hour weeks in the beginning and I loved it. It was yeah. it was so fun, you know? So just like you said, even though I was making peanuts, if you look at it on a, an hourly basis, it was, uh, I, I guess, just because I had so much more ownership over the process, it was it was so much more enjoyable and fulfilling for me. I agree. And I see the frustration that uh, bosses have now for employees that aren't as engaged and aren't putting in honest day's work. It's just so frustrating for me. It's like, don't you realize I'm paying you? Why are you looking? <laughs> why are you on your computer? I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, things have come full circle. <laughs> yes, they have. It's almost like we get the quality system. It's just payback. <laughs> there we go. Karma again. Yep. All right. Well, let's see. Look, just a couple more questions, and I think we'll we'll wrap things up here. But looking back over your career, what what are a couple of key lessons that you've learned that you think um, others could apply to to being successful as an engineer, especially if you, if you can um, frame those within the context of of a story or two that come to mind? Sure. Uh, the thing that popped into my head, and I may I may have missed the second part of your question because I immediately started thinking about something, and you know, much like my story of how I decided on engineering, I just have sort of floated through life and just kind of taken things as they came. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really make a conscious effort of what am I really interested in? And maybe I'll just try something and see how it goes. And I got lucky in that, that thing that I tried, I really liked. I would like to think that I would be willing to try and that if I didn't like it, have the courage to switch to something else and I think if you go in with that mindset of you don't have to have everything figured out, you could just try it and go, oh, that's not for me. Let's let's do something else. But always be looking at what you, what each job has to offer and what it can teach you. Um, so I I got my undergraduate degree and then I played a couple of years of volleyball and then I came back and got my graduate degree and then or well before I before I started my graduate degree, I got this job as a software tester while I was waiting to, while I was applying for grad schools. And, and it's amazing to me how much that software testing, that $8 an hour software testing job has applied to my life. You know, things that I've learned about like going through process, how the software works, because I had never done like, you know, SolidWorks, the CAD before. So that training also helped me do that. And then at one point I was in charge of, you know, putting graphics on knee braces. So that exposure to that software, it happened to be a, you know, a a design software. So that helped me with that. And it just really taught me that like every single job that you have has something to teach you, no matter how menial it seems, whether it's communication with other people, getting along with people, skills, they're always going to teach you something. Um, So I would just uh, advise people to, you know, 
try things. Don't be concerned about whether or not it's a perfect fit and then learn everything that you can from that. And then I would also advise people to um, advocate for yourself. So I had a I had a coworker that started at the same time as I did, and he was always in the boss's office. You know, he was going, um, you know, what can I be doing? What can I, how can I further my career? Um, and he, he bought a bike so that he could ride at lunchtime with him. And I just thought that was so gross and I didn't do that. Well, guess what? He got promoted and he got more stuff and he learned a lot faster than I did because he was actively, you know, pursuing it, telling the boss how interested he was in uh, getting better and learning more. And while I still would not advocate going on bike rides at lunch just to kind of, you know, kiss butt, I, I, I would have liked to, I wish should have gone in the office a little bit more and said, you know, help me, you know, I, you have a lot to teach me. What, what are some options for me? How can I learn more? What can I do faster? That guy got sent to SolidWorks classes. I had to learn it on my own. And I just kept thinking, you know, my work will speak for itself, you know, and that's not necessarily true. So you've got to really kind of showcase what you do in a non-sleazy way. You know, you've got to just be asking. Otherwise, you might get missed. That is tremendous real world advice. I think a lot of people hopefully will will take to heart and, and greatly benefit from. Thank you for sharing that. Well, last question here, specifically within your uh, within the context of your role as an engineer, what is one thing that frustrates you and one thing that brings you joy? I feel like I'm on an interview right now. See, you are on an interview right now. Exactly. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> Have you not been here the last 34, 40 minutes? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, if this whole Photoshop thing doesn't work out, I'm going to come work at Pipeline. So um, <laughs> if I pass this you. interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, your your last answer was right there. That was like worth the price of admission right there. Ter- <laughs> terrific advice. I really enjoyed that. But yes, back to the current question. What frustrates you and what brings you joy within the context of engineering? I guess what's really uh, frustrating for me as far as working with other engineers, um, usually engineers are very motivated people um, and it's easy to manage engineers because they, they get their satisfaction from solving problems. So you don't have to motivate them as much, but it's super frustrating to work with people that don't care about the project and who drop the ball and you have to pick up their slack. Uh, it's the same as being a mom, right? It's, it's super frustrating that they say they'll do something and then they don't. Um, I find that really frustrating. I find bosses that are um, more interested in them looking good than solving the actual problem, um, super frustrating. And I guess that's just the hands-on part of me that I just want. Uh, I want things to make sense and I want people to make logical decisions. <laughs> and that's... That's not always the case. So I'm not sure how helpful that is because you're always going to encounter that, but super frustrating for me. And then uh, the other part of the question is what brings me joy, right? Right. The, the joy is in, in solving that problem, is in finding ways to either work with people, finding ways to uh, get the design input to accomplish the design input. Um, that's that's the fun part for me. Um Yesterday, uh, again, I was working on this mold design and I, I just couldn't figure out how to put something together. And um, uh, I finally figured it out this morning. Oh, and I'm wow. feeling, I am feeling really good. I slept on yeah. it and finally figured it out. Sometimes it's battling the software. Sometimes it's, you know, battling the design. Um, that brings me joy. And also, I really like working with young engineers that maybe don't understand plastics and how molds have to be designed and how how parts need to be taken out of molds, and then coaching them on, um, you know, hey, did you think about doing this? And if you did this, it could save you a lot of money. And maybe we could make this part of the mold modular so that you can try a bunch of different things and having to see the lights come on and and having them get excited about their designs and learning something. So that's really fun for me too. I spent some time as a volleyball coach. I coached fourth through sixth graders, you know, for 10 years and just um, seeing that, seeing the lights come on and, and making people love what they do is brings me joy as well. Yeah. Very fulfilling. All right. Well, great. That was all wonderful. Thank you so much, Dylan, for being on the show today. 
Um, how can people get in touch with you? If you have something that you want molded, it's uh, protoshopinc.com and or um, I'm happy to give out my email address if you want to just contact me directly. It's D Seriani, C-E-R-I-A-N-I at protoshopinc.com. Awesome. Great. Well, what what a delight it was to spend some time with you today, Dylan, and uh, cover prototype molding and different materials and uh, um, uh, hear some of your, your pro tips and, and tricks. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. And I will for sure send business your way. I think what you're doing there is amazing. Ah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I told you all about the, the hockey pucks that we're making then, right? Yeah, <laughs> automated. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks, Aaron. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you like what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.